Hi, everybody, and welcome. My name is Neil Seidman, and I'm the co-chair of the Public Education Committee for ADAA. That's the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. And welcome to our webinar. It's entitled, Can You Fully Recover from an Eating Disorder? A Roadmap to Recovery for Sufferers and Loved Ones. And we're really fortunate. Uh, our presenter is best-selling author, Jenny Schaefer. Now, there's a huge connection between eating disorders and anxiety and depression. And before we start, I'd like to say just a little bit about ADAA. That's the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. So ADAA is the leading nonprofit organization in the field of anxiety and depression. And our mission is to improve diagnosis and promote the prevention, treatment, and cure of anxiety, depression, and stress-related disorders through education, like this webinar, practice, and research. And we, er we work to try to end the stigma of mental health conditions and to get the word out that these conditions, they're real, they're serious, and they're treatable. And I want to invite everybody to really take advantage of the ADAA website. That's ADAA.org. And one of the great resources is a list of treatment providers right on the home page. You'll see the Find a Therapist link. And in addition, uh, we have a free peer to peer online support group. Uh, which I want to encourage people to explore. And then finally, you can support ADAA, which is a nonprofit, by making a charitable donation on the website. Okay, so let's get started. I'm really pleased to introduce our presenter. Jenny Schaefer is an internationally known speaker and best selling author in the field of eating disorders. Uh, Jenny has appeared on the Today Show, Dr. Oz, Dr. Phil. She's had publications uh, in uh, uh, media from Cosmopolitan to the New York Times. Uh, she has several books, uh, Life Without ED, Goodbye ED, Hello Me, and Almost Anorexic, which is a collaboration with Harvard Medical School. And she's currently at work on a book about PTSD, which is going to be released in 2020. Uh, Jenny is a senior fellow with an organization called the Meadows Behavioral Healthcare, and she's an advocate for its specialty eating disorders program which is the Meadows Ranch. And then also Jenny is very active with a wonderful organization called the National Eating Disorders Association, or NIDA for short. Uh, Jenny is a NIDA ambassador. And for people that want to uh, take advantage of that wonderful resource, the website is nationaleatingdisorders.org nationaleatingdisorders.org. That's the website for NIDA. So let me turn it over now to Jenny. Hey, Neil. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, great to have you. Here. Let's see. All right. I'm trying to show my screen here. Do you see it yet? There we go. Looks great. All right. Awesome. Let me minimize. How did you say I get the control panel out? A little, a little orange button. You can All click. Right. That'll that'll minimize your uh, control panel. Okay, here we are. Perfect. Okay. So it's it's actually great that we already had a little snafu there because part of my talk is about 
dealing with perfectionism, which is often tied to eating disorders. And in life, I've had to learn that oftentimes, most of the time, nothing goes perfectly. So we've already experienced I, I've that. certainly found that for myself. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I kind of like it sometimes when things go wrong in talks, because I can always point that out. And things always go wrong. But but thanks so much for having me, Neil. And it's such an honor. I'm, I'm so excited to do this with ADAA. I, I'm really glad you mentioned their find a therapist point on their website because actually when I was in recovery for post-traumatic stress disorder, which was my second recovery after my eating disorder, I actually found my therapist on ADAA's website. So it means a lot to me. It's kind of like life come full circle that I'm getting to do this talk with ADAA. So thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. So, well, I want to, first of all, before we really dive into the question everyone's looking at on the screen there, I want to point out something that you mentioned that's really important is how does this topic of eating disorders relate to depression and anxiety? And the truth is that a high percentage of people with eating disorders experience both anxiety and depression. And I'm one example of that. So as I'm speaking today, I'm not speaking from a clinician perspective. Like you, I'm actually an advocate. I'm a, I'm a patient advocate. I'm, I'm a person who recovered. So personally, I had an eating disorder, as we'll see throughout this webinar, but I also had anxiety and depression. And what I learned later on and throughout my recovery is that I was actually utilizing my eating disorder kind of as a way to cope or manage the anxiety and depression. And, and you know what? It kind of worked in the beginning, but of course, in the end, it was not a, a good coping strategy. It was definitely not adaptive. And to recover, I had to find other ways to cope with anxiety and depression. But what we know about anxiety disorders, this I think is really interesting, about two thirds of people with eating disorders also have an anxiety disorder. So that's like OCD or panic disorder, which I know you know a lot about, and generalized anxiety disorder. That statistic also includes post-traumatic stress disorder, which used to be included in the D in the uh, anxiety disorder category of the DSM. Right, right. two out of three. So th this is really a really d big connection between the experience of eating disorder and the experience of anxiety disorder when two out of three people with an eating disorder also uh, would meet the criteria for an anxiety disorder uh, these two categories they're they're distinct and the and the approaches you know are related to whether we're talking about eating disorder at the moment or an anxiety disorder but there's such a big overlap uh, so our uh, people that are watching us, uh, watching our webinar and listening to us right now, uh, it is the most common experience of people with an eating disorder that they also are struggling and facing uh, the anxiety challenges. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, what's interesting about that is the majority of those people, the anxiety disorder actually preceded the eating disorder. So I know for a fact that was my case, so I struggled with OCD as well as generalized anxiety disorder, and that all came about before the eating disorder. And again, in my life, I, I do think in many ways the eating disorder was a way for me to kind of try to manage those symptoms. But something else interesting about anxiety when it comes to anorexia nervosa specifically, which is my story this and we can thank my colleague dr walter k for a lot of these studies on anorexia and anxiety but what what they found was that for people with anorexia nervosa actually restricting food reduces anxiety so think about that if if dieting or if reducing your intake reduces your anxiety then that's a big motivation to eat less, right? If you have kind of a debilitating anxiety. So for people with anorexia nervosa, we believe that function is actually happening in the brain, where for a lot of people, it might be the opposite, where if people might emotionally eat to kind of cope with anxiety. So it's it's some real, there's some really interesting findings. Very, very interesting. Yeah. Very, very interesting. So if I start out with a big anxiety challenge and I find that restricting my eating temporarily uh, calms down that anxiety, then now I'm entering into that, you know, uh, eating disorder area. Yeah, so that, that kind of can be helpful for any loved ones watching. 
it, it can be very frustrating to have one of your family member or someone you know for struggling with an eating disorder it can be really hard to make sense of but i think sometimes it really helps to know what's really happening in the brain you know this is a real life-threatening disorder and like you said in the intro these illnesses are treatable and that's what we're talking about today i mean my slide you know can you fully recover from an eating disorder i'm going to spoil it for you now but the answer is yes <laughs> you can so that's the hope i want to give and and real quick just to note depression because we're linking that too, you know, de depression, what we know about that in eating disorders is similar to anxiety. Like depression may contribute to someone developing an eating disorder. So it could be like for me, I struggled with depression, but if I binged eat or if I restricted, that would kind of alleviate my depression, depression for a while. So for some people, depression might be like a risk factor to developing an eating disorder. But what we also know through brain studies is that there are neurobiological changes in the brain that happen when someone has an eating disorder that can actually cause depression. So in this case, you take someone with an eating disorder and if they, in this example, restricting food, we know that mal malnutrition can actually change the brain drastically and sometimes this malnutrition can actually have drastic mood changes in people so the mere act of just losing weight for some people can actually create depression in the brain for some people does that make sense yeah so again very big connection now we're talking about depression very big connection between eating disorder and depression or i might start out with uh challenges with depression and get a little bit of temporary relief through my eating disorder and then on the other hand the eating disorder itself can physiologically produce depression so yeah again, it's a very very big connection here yeah and again you know all this stuff is so helpful for families to see this is an eating disorder is a real real illness it, from it affects everything from from the tip of your toes to the hair on your head everything in between especially the brain and but so to to kind of tie it into can you fully recover from an eating disorder the title of our talk yes you can now what's interesting is I was not born with an eating disorder but I was pr born with a vulnerability to anxiety and depression, right? So when I fully recovered from my eating disorder, that doesn't mean that I'm no longer an anxious person or that I never struggle with depression. Well, absolutely not. I fully recovered from my eating disorder. I don't have an eating disorder anymore, but I am a highly anxious person. I still have that trait. I, that's never gonna go away. The good news is that I can learn and I have learned how to manage that trait, how to how to even use that trait for good in some ways. I've actually heard a friend of mine, Carolyn Costin, as a therapist in the eating disorder field. She talks about kind of harnessing the good out of anxiety and it can make you highly energetic. Right. So I like that idea. <laughs> I also like to think maybe my anxiety makes me highly creative, because if you think about it, anxiety is very creative. Like I can think of 100 things that can go wrong right now, you know, <laughs> and that's not very useful. But but what if I can kind of utilize that trait for good? And that's what I've learned to do. And yeah, same inst instead of instead of trying to uh, suppress it. Right, with, absolutely. Uh, something like an eating disorder. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, and just to, so to give hope to everybody, you know, there are a lot of tools out there for these illnesses. And and yes, you're not born with an eating disorder. It's a learned behavior. You can unlearn it. And with any of those traits that you were born with, like anxiety, you know, you can learn how to cope with it. And it it no longer destroys my life like it used to. I mean, anxiety is just something that's there. It's not always there, you know, which is an improvement. <laughs> and I know, and I, it's just way, it's, it's really unimaginable to be better than it, how it was, but, but let's go back to how it was in the beginning. So this is, I'm going to give you my little short life story of my eating disorder developing. So that picture there in the yellow dance costume, I was about four years old in that picture. And this usually surprises a lot of people, but I remember hearing the voice of my eating disorder as young as four years old. And that actually came in the form of negative body image thoughts. So I remember that dance costume and already having negative thoughts about my body. Now, what's interesting is some research actually shows that 42% of girls in grades one through three want to lose weight. So already first grade through third grade, 
forty two first grade. Forty percent. Wow. And forty five percent of boys and girls in grades three through six want to be thinner. So, and 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 this in many ways has something to do with our culture. We live in a culture that does tell us that to be thin is to be happy, is to be successful. And I can tell you that is a lie. At my absolute thinnest weight, I was definitely not happy. I was not successful. It was, it's a lie. And I think many of us know that intellectually, but our society really does endorse the thin ideal. Now, media does not cause eating disorders, but what we know and what was the case in my life is genetics loads the gun for an eating disorder, environment pulls the trigger. So the environment for me had to do with what I just mentioned, our culture that endorses the thin ideal. But it wasn't just that that caused my eating disorder. I had to have some genetic vulnerability as I did with anxiety, like I said before, depression, but also, like I, I had other other things as well, like perfectionism was one. I had uh, I have a detail oriented brain. I tend to have a little bit of impulsivity, and these are all traits that we're going to see a little bit later in the webinar are are common among people with eating disorders. But so as that four year old right there, I already was hearing negative body image thoughts. I called it the voice of Ed. So you'll hear I actually learned to treat my eating disorder like a like a distinct person, like an ent entity separate from myself. And so I call it Ed, which is an acronym for eating disorder, ED. But in my life, Ed kind of came along slowly. And, and this is importantly, this is my story. This is not everyone's story. Eating disorders develop all different ways. Sometimes people develop eating disorders in their 50s or 40s or 60s even, you know, so keep in mind this is this is one story but in the middle picture there in the roller skates I, so at that age i was already restricting food a little bit so how old, how old were you in that picture? i was probably about 12 in that picture 11 or so mm -hmm. and what i remember was already being afraid in elementary school of like eating birthday cake at birthday parties as an example and and i already was restricting my food because I'd heard, you know, on television commercials and all kinds of things. And I grew up in the 90s. So back then, fat fat was bad. It was like everything you're supposed to buy, zero fat, no fat, low fat. And I grew up with this mentality that fat is bad. You should never have fat, you know. It'll, but the truth is, in my recovery, guess what? I had to add fat to my diet. I became friends with fat. And I love fat today. In fact, I specifically will add fat to whatever I'm eating because fat, we need fat in our brains. We also need fat to make us feel full, you know. So anyway, but back then, I was already restricting food. And eventually for me, restricting food led to binging. And this is common for many people. It's biological. If you reduce your food intake enough, your body wants to binge eat. This again, it, it's biological. I mean, if you think about the caveman days, you know, prehistoric days, back then our bodies really were set up for feast or famine because we never knew when we were going to kill another buffalo, right? But right. So, so if I, so it, back in caveman days, the, the food restriction part of it was we didn't find any food that day right. or that there was week. A famine. Right. Yeah. And it wasn't that I was, you know, turning down birthday cake. It was that right, there was right. no food available. And then when food was available, it made a lot of sense. Let's fill up as much as we can. So there would be your, your, your binging. Yeah. Oh, Neil, you're so good. I love it. Yes, that's it. exactly my point. And just like you, you said with the famine, it didn't have anything to do with not wanting to eat birthday cake with the feast. What's interesting about bodies is today, like my body doesn't know on a, on an, on the amygdala level that, that there's like a McDonald's by my house, right? Like my body doesn't know that there, we live in a society where food is everywhere in our in here in America, right? For many and of that's, us, and that's not the way our old brain. So the amygdala being part of our old brain, that's our survival response. That old part of our brain just did not develop at a time when there was food available everywhere. So that's a totally different environment that we have today. Right, right. So and that's where when the old brain is running the show, I mean, it's such a good point. So if I've been in a famine or not eating, restricting on purpose or dieting, a lot of people struggle with chronic dieting. My body thinks I'm in a famine. 
It doesn't know there's food all around my house, right? In my, it doesn't know I have a kitchen filled with food. And so when my body eventually gets around food again, say I go to a party or something like that, it's gonna wanna eat all of it. It thinks we just killed a buffalo and we better eat it all because we don't know when we're gonna get it again. And so I to share all this just again, show loved ones as well as sufferers. It's not your fault if you're in this cycle of binging and restricting. There are biological reasons biological things get your brain kind of locked in a gear where you get stuck in that cycle. That's not your fault. Now, it is our responsibility to get help and to choose recovery. We don't choose to have eating disorders. So, you know, really important there. But for me, like I said, the restricting led to binging. And I mentioned that because in that last picture, that's my college high school graduation. I was salutatorian of a class of like, I don't know, 500 people. I mentioned that because that was kind of perfectionism during running the show. A lot of times people with anorexia nervosa and other eating disorders tend to be highly perfectionistic, very motivated, and often they're at the top of their class. They're either straight A students, not everyone, but often. In fact, so often that a lot of treatment centers actually will require their patients with eating disorders, if they're in school, they will require them to get a B. And patients do not like this at all. <laughs> but but that what was an interesting idea of as a way of actually behaviorally dealing with perfectionism. Say, well, I want you, your assignment is you have to get a B in that class. Yeah, totally. I mean, I <laughs> needed that assignment in this picture, but that's my mom and dad. I actually am lucky. I grew up in a very loving family with great parents. But I had that picture there because this, I'm holding my little salutatorian speech in my hand and I had binged the night before. Because again, the restricting, all that restricting all those years led to me starting to binge. And I, in that picture, I am smiling, but you can probably tell that's a fake smile. And I'm actually thinking in the back of my head, oh my goodness, I just binged last night. Now I'm gonna have a party today with my friends and family for graduation. There's gonna be cake and food and what am I gonna do? Cause now I need to restrict. I mean, this is the eating disorder brain, right? And so unfortunately the eating disorder takes us out of the moment, takes us out of life and really hijacks our life, hijacks our brain. And in that picture, I should have been experiencing joy and celebration on my graduation day from high school, but instead, I was really struggling inside. And I think that's so important for people to know. An eating disorder can go, it can hide for so, so long. People cannot tell. For most of my life, all in these pictures, I was really a normal weight. I was not below weight. I was a normal weight. People looked at me, they didn't think I had an eating disorder because people tend to think an eating disorder looks a certain way but it, it doesn't, and that's one of the myths of eating disorders. But also, I was very highly successful at the time. I was making straight A's. I mean, people looked at me and thought I had everything going for me. The pain can hide on the inside. The pain can hide behind fake smiles. And so we have to keep that in mind when we think about people in our life who might be struggling. It's often, it could be the person who's highly functional. It could be the person who's always smiling. You, you just never know. Anyone could have an eating disorder. Jenny, well, how com how common are these eating disorders? Yeah, you know, in America, we believe that about 20 million women at some point in their life will have an eating disorder and about 10 million men. Wow. So that's a lot of people, you know? I mean, this illness, these illnesses in impact so many people. But for me, after high school, I went to college, and this is the part where I actually lost a lot of weight. And I don't include pictures of that because I don't like to show images that sometimes can be considered triggering to other people. But in college, I lost a lot of weight fast, and that's when I would have been diagnosed with anorexia nervosa had I got appropriate help. But I lost a lot of weight fast, and what was really interesting and quite sad, actually, is that my new friends in college who didn't know me before throughout my whole life, they actually were complimenting me on my size. So I was getting complimented daily. People were saying, wow, you eat so little. How do you do it? Or you're so small. How do you do it? So I was getting complimented for having a psychiatric illness with the highest mortality rate of any other. That's pretty shocking, and it happens all the time with eating disorders. Eating so disorder anorexia is a life-threatening condition. 
Oh, absolutely. Like, yeah. All eating disorders are life threatening conditions. Yeah. I mean, bulimia, all of them. I mean, I know I have a friend who was 19. She died of bulimia nervosa in her sleep of cardiac arrest. I mean, and she was a normal weight at the time. In fact, people thought she was the picture of health, right? So, I mean, these illnesses are, are deadly, but, you know, keep staying with the hopeful message. There is recovery and there's a lot of great treatment out there. It's, it's sometimes hard to find the appropriate care, but we'll talk about how to get that. But so for me, I, I ended up losing a lot of weight in college and I did actually try to go to the college doctor and I told her that my friends from high school, now ones who had known me my whole life, they did not compliment my weight loss. They actually thought I had an eating disorder. And I went to the college doctor and basically listed all kinds of diagnostic criteria for anorexia nervosa. And she said, well, do you eat? And I will tell you, Neil, that is not a good diagnostic question for an eating disorder. Um, I said, yes. And she said, well, you're fine. It's a big campus. It's a stressful time. You're just really stressed out and i walked out of her office and i did not get help for another five years so that's why i'm really passionate about doing things like this because i don't want people to miss opportunities to get help but for me finally i did get help after college and i was 22 years old and we'll get into that a lot of that in a in just a few slides how i actually got better but before that i really want to focus on just busting some myths that I already talked about some of these, but they're so key. People with eating disorders don't look a certain way and, and eating disorders don't discriminate, right? Anybody of any culture, ethnicity, gender can have an eating disorder. And like I said, it's genetics plays a big role in this. In fact, 50 to 80% of an eating disorder risk factor is actually due to genetics, 50 to 80%. So that's something that maybe I inherited from my family, but, but my family did not cause my eating disorder. Families can't cause eating disorders and eating disorder is such a complicated illness. There's no way that someone could create one if they actually tried, because you really have to have that genetic piece. If you don't have that genetic piece, then you're not gonna get an eating disorder. There, you really have to have that vulnerability. But something that's very key, and in my story is what's last here on the slide. S sometimes people think, well, if I don't have an officially recognized eating disorder, which those are anorexia, bulimia, or binge eating disorder, if I don't have one of those, then I don't, I don't deserve help. Well, that is absolutely not true. And in fact, my last book was an invited project by Harvard Medical School, and it's all about, the whole book, Almost Anorexic, is about the fact that people who don't meet criteria for anorexia or any other officially recognized eating disorder, they can be just as compromised, struggling just as much as those other people. Really, the diagnostic categories, as you know, Neil, they're just kind of our best guess at how to classify these things so we can have research and health insurance, right? But the truth is, in many ways, it's rather arbitrary whether or not someone has an illness or not. And an example is like with, with anorexia nervosa in DSM-4, which is a book therapist used to diagnose eating disorders. In DSM-4, it said that someone had to ha have lost 15% of their body weight to be diagnosed with anorexia. Well, that was a really strict criteria. And what we did in DSM-5 was we took that out. And now it's up to the doctor to decide if someone is underweight. So overnight, essentially, when the new DSM came out in 2013, a bunch of people who did not have anorexia nervosa all of a sudden had anorexia nervosa when they woke up the next day when DSM-5 came out because that one specific weight requirement was taken out. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, and what, what I find really helpful about these diagnostic criteria is uh, and categories is they can connect us with the best resources so if i don't meet the criteria for anorexia nervosa but i'm in that gray category uh, where i'm having a lot of the symptoms and it's affecting my life and that's a risky situation for me, then the same tools and resources that you're introducing us to can be really, really helpful. 
Absolutely. And I think, I mean, you nailed it. For me, the importance of diagnosis is it's a compass for help. You know, it's a compass to show this is the this is the treatment that works. And luckily when I well, when I was diagnosed with anorexia nervosa, I, I didn't know anything about the mental health field or diagnosis or tr evidence-based treatment. I knew I knew nothing. I was just making it up as I go. But years and years later when i got diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder as soon as i got that diagnosis which took a long time i realized oh wow okay this means there's help like if i have this actual disorder there's help and that's how i got help was because of that diagnosis and actually ptsd is important here on this slide and trauma because sometimes if you look at what I was saying about genetics loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger. For some people, environment can be things like the friends they had, the family they grew up with. Again, it's like the thin ideal we talked about our culture, but environment can also be, for some people, trauma. So there actually is a big connection between trauma and PTSD and eating disorders as well. So for some people, in the environment could be trauma and for those people who have trauma who develop ptsd ptsd seems to be the mediating factor to developing an eating disorder so it's not that you had trauma it's that you had trauma that developed ptsd that tends to lead to the development of the eating disorder we think that's so again people yeah so again we're seeing this big connection between anxiety disorders and eating disorders oh yeah i mean absolutely huge huge so, but moving along, so we've mentioned some of these, but let me, for those of you who don't know all the eating disorders, just real briefly, you know, anorexia nervosa is probably the one that gets talked talked about most on TV, although it's, it's not the most prevalent of all the eating disorders by far. In fact, you know, while one in 200 adults have experienced full-blown anorexia, at least one in 20 have exhibited key symptoms, but they don't meet criteria. So they fall in that almost anorexic zone or, what's good, what's other specified feeding or eating disorder which is the last part of the slide here osfed so osfed is really the most common eating disorder but people tend to know anorexia nervosa more and anorexia nervosa is it's, it's restricting of food but and it, and it has to lead to being underweight so you cannot be diagnosed with anorexia nervosa unless you are underweight but like i said we removed that very strict criteria of a specific number what that weight has to be People with anorexia nervosa also tend to have struggle with body image. And well, moving on to bulimia nervosa, that tends to be the binging behaviors and then following it up with some kind of compens compensatory behavior. And many people hear about vomiting and there's been made for TV movies about bulimia nervosa, you know, but so that eating disorder is probably talked about second most. But bulimia nervosa is not always vomiting people actually can compensate for food in all kinds of ways and i'm not going to give the specifics on that because actually that can be triggering give people ideas but just keep in mind that bulimia nervosa is it's a spectrum it's not just throwing up there's other ways people compensate that is that's very very unhealthy and, and destructive like i said I've, I've known people die from bulimia nervosa because it it really compromises your heart and your electrolytes and binge eating disorder, thank goodness, was finally added to the officially recognized eating disorder category in 2013. And, and of anorexia and bulimia, and, and between those three at the top, binge eating disorder is definitely the most common. And binge eating disorder is different from bulimia nervosa in that you have the binging, but you don't have the purging behaviors. So you're not doing anything to compensate for the, the, the binge eating. And really important for people to know, binge eating it's not just when you're at Thanksgiving and you happen to eat an extra slice of your mom's pie. That's not technically a binge for this kind of criteria. Binge eating is really eating an amount of food that no person would eat in that given amount of time. So eating an excessive amount of food in a short amount of time and feeling uncontrolled. Like you cannot control it. That's It felt, feels like your body's like taken over by an alien or something and it's binging and you feel like you cannot stop that so it has this kind of compulsive uh, overwhelming kind of quality to the experience absolutely so that's why with family members if you have a, someone in your family binging and it can be tempting to say well just stop you know <laughs> but would you tell that to an alcoholic well just stop drinking well no there's more 
to that. You know, these behaviors really get locked in the brain and neurobiological processes start happening that change the way the brain works. So it's not a matter of just stopping binging and restricting and purging. People cannot, when they're stuck in that cycle, they can't just stop. Now, once they get treatment, they can learn how to change those behaviors. And that's what recovery is. It's neuroplasticity. It's changing the way our brain works, but it takes time. But again, so the big eating disorder category that's the most common eating disorder that's not talked about is OSFED, other specified feeding or eating disorder. And there's about, there's five different subcategories of that. And and atypical anorexia is when people have all the signs of anorexia nervosa, only they're not underweight. This is such a common disorder. And I really want people to hear this one. So people can struggle with all of the signs of anorexia, restricting body image, and they might be a normal weight or even above what people would consider a normal weight. And this is- And it, so it sounds like you met that criteria at one point in your path. Oh yeah, I mean, I did. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. I actually am glad you mentioned that because I was, I would have been diagnosed with OSFED. In fact, yeah, you're right. It would have been atypical anorexia. I, didn't, I never thought about that till now. Thank you, Neil. <laughs> but, um, it would have been during high school. You know, I wish some, these are very important diagnoses that, Finally, we are talking about them, but but for a long time, nobody was. And so subthreshold bulimia and binge eating disorder are simply when you're not binging or purging enough to meet the full criteria for bulimia and binge eating disorder. So you're kind of just below full criteria. But again, research even shows that people who fall in these categories of OSFED, they can be just as physically compromised, they can be just as sick or even worse than people with anorexia, bulimia, or binge eating disorder. So these categories are not a measure of severity and I really need people to understand that because oftentimes people think I'm not sick enough to get help. And the truth is, if you're watching this webinar and you relate to anything I'm saying and your life is you're struggling because of food and body image and weight and you deserve help. And, you know, that's the bottom line. But purging disorder is an interesting one. I'm gl really glad we added this to DSM-5. Purging disorder is when you purge without binging. And this happens a lot, too. So sometimes people will eat a normal meal and then throw up afterwards. That's not bulimia nervosa because you have to binge to have bulimia nervosa. So again, an important caveat is purging disorder is it looks like bulimia nervosa, only you're just not binge eating. And so this can be a very serious disorder along the lines of bulimia nervosa. I mean, think about it. Somebody who eats normal sized meals every day and throws up every meal. That's pretty serious, right? So that's a purging disorder. Night eating syndrome is really common and we're just hearing more about this. And that's when you consume most of your calories after your evening meal. So sometimes people will graze all night long or wake up in the middle of the night and eat. And people remember it. It's not that you're, you're eating in your sleep, but this is such a common disorder that we really need to get more research about it. Cause I, I'm in my travels, I actually meet so many people who struggle with night eating syndrome. But again, that all just came out in, in DSM-5. But that's my book there, Almost Anorexic. If you relate to any of, of those five categories, I'd, I'd definitely say check it out. I actually am quite lucky. I got to write that with uh, Dr. Jennifer Thomas, who's a Harvard professor. So that's, um, you know, I'm pretty lucky. I learned a lot, actually. And I, that's how I got involved with ADAA, Neil. My, my, co my friend who wrote Almost Anxious, Dr. Luana Marquez, Marquez, oh. The one, yeah, she's you know Luana. Sure. She, um, she's awesome. She actually is the one who helped me figure out the evidence-based treatments for PTSD. And but anyway, I, that book brought me a lot of new friends, including Luana and ADA. So I'm so grateful I got to do that. But so signs and symptoms. We've already talked about a lot of these, and and in my story, you could see that. You know, I mentioned in college I lost weight. And if anybody would have really gotten to my brain, you would have said I had this, you would have seen I had a preoccupation with weight and eating. But for me, oftentimes I kept that hidden. So that wasn't something people could see. But if you're concerned about someone in your life, it might be someone who's kind of always dieting or always talking about food, always talking about their weight. That can be a sign of an eating disorder. Something people don't know a lot about is, but what I said is an eating disorder affects the hair on your head head to the tip of your toes. I mean, it literally makes your hair brittle, your nails brittle. My hair was falling out in clumps. If you notice 
in your sink or bathtub, there's lots of hair, whether it's yours or your loved one, that can be a sign of an eating disorder. You can tell sometimes if someone's binge eating by a disappearance of a lot of food. I used to work at an office and when I was binge eating, if anybody would have looked in my trash can, they would have seen an abnormal amount of trash cans and food wrappers in the trash can. It's a sign of, sign of binge eating. Purging, sometimes people, when they were making themselves throw up, they get what it's called chipmunk cheeks. So it's kind of swollen carotid glands. And, but, or you might see people have like scars on the back of their hands. But something that's beyond the weight and food, because again, these disorders, they're not really about weight and food. Now they are when you look at them from the outside. But the truth is from the inside, like we said, an eating disorder is really about a lot more. It's about anxiety, depression. It's a way to deal with OCD, low self-esteem, perfectionism. There's so much more to an eating disorder than the food and the body image weight piece. So then we're looking at other things. Well, isolation is a big sign of an eating disorder. If someone in your family is all of a sudden not wanting to do anything, it can be because they're trying to avoid food. I mean, if you think about it in our society, what do people do when they get together? They eat. That's pretty much what everyone does, right? Let's go to dinner, lunch, whatever. And for someone with an eating disorder, that can be so isolating because, wow, you just don't want to go anywhere. But other signs of an eating disorder is that what we talked about earlier, those neurobiological changes, especially from malnutrition, can cause mood swings. So I know as a, as a teenager, I was super moody, not just because of it being a teenager, but because of my eating disorder, it got worse and worse in college. And then right after I graduated, and oftentimes I, I would take that out. It was this anger on my little brother. I feel so bad for him now, but we're, we've made up. But sometimes if you're someone in your family just has extreme mood swings, that can actually be the sign of an eating disorder. And a lot of people with eating disorders miss their periods. In college, I hardly ever had a period. That was a big sign that I had anorexia nervosa. And all of these these things that we do with food can really mess up our concentration. So my last semester in college, my grades started dropping drastically. I went from like straight A's to getting a C and I think a B and something else. And like, and that to me was like, whoa, like for someone who had always gotten straight A's, but I could no longer, I could no longer concentrate anymore. And if looking back, even when I was making straight A's, I, I really had to overwork because I couldn't concentrate. I just study way more than everyone else because I was so sick, my brain was not working. So this is a really, really helpful uh, uh, list of bullet points for helping us to recognize an eating disorder in a loved one or friend, and also uh, in ourselves, if we might be struggling with uh, either a full eating disorder or in one of those gray areas, almost anorexic category. Um, it's really, really helpful to take a minute maybe and just uh, pause the, uh, the webinar if you want and maybe make a couple of notes. Really, really helpful. Thank you, Jenny, for this. Yeah, and, and for those of you who would like to find more information, actually the National Eating Disorders Association website has an exhaustive list of signs and symptoms. So I would encourage you to, to check that out as well. And so moving on, so as we said, an eating disorder has a lot to do with genetics. So I like to point out something you can look for in a friend or family member or yourself if you think you might be struggling is not just the specific eating disorder signs and symptoms that we just saw, but look and see, do I have the genetic vulnerability to possibly having an eating disorder? These are actually, to me, really great signs and symptoms. Because essentially, if someone you know has like all the anorexic traits on this slide that you're looking at, and you, and you already think, well, this person might have an eating disorder, well, they're even more likely to if they have every single anorexic trait on this list. That doesn't mean they have and they do have an eating disorder. Only a professional can tell you if you have an eating disorder. But these are helpful guidelines. So this this handout, it's actually a handout. You can download it on my website and with a, a blank, a blank handout. These are my answers, my responses, what I would have checked under all these categories. But the important part, the part I love about this slide and this exercise is. So I was born with these traits, but I was not born with an eating disorder. I was born with these traits. So that means if I recover from my eating disorder, I'm still gonna have these traits. 
So how can I use these traits for good, for life? Now, what happened was in the beginning, I used these traits in the service of an eating disorder. So if you look at the general eating disorder traits, perfectionism, I'll tell you what, Neil, like that was really helpful in anorexia nervosa. So was obsessive compulsiveness. Those traits helped me be really good at anorexia nervosa. But what if I take those traits and I apply them to recovery? Wow, then that's really good at fighting anorexia nervosa. What if I'm perfectionistic about going to therapy? You know, what if I'm obsessive compulsive about doing my therapy homework? That's I love those ideas that we're really kind of switching our energy from a destructive way of coping to a life uh, affirming way of coping. Yeah, and I love, I mentioned my co-author, Jennifer Thomas, Dr. Jennifer Thomas from Harvard. We created this handout together and it's in our book, but I loved it. She, When I first got this draft from her, it said positive traits. You see that in the title, matching positive traits to life goals. And I told Jenny, I said, I call her Jenny. I said, Jenny, you know, how, how come these are positive traits? I thought they were negative. And she said, oh no, they're, they're positive traits. People just tend to use them in a negative way. You take, we take them to the dark and we, we learn later often, hopefully, how to take them to the light. So if you have these traits, this is not a curse that you're born to be miserable and have an eating disorder. These traits are actually good. And we'll see that more as we go along. So but moving on. So I really wanna break this down into kind of six different topics. These are, this is kind of how I recovered. And keep in mind, this is me. Again, everybody's treatment path looks different. And in order to tackle all of these six different phases, it was really important that I had a treatment team. And we'll get to a slide that talks about how to find a treatment team. But a treatment team means, for me, it meant having doctors. So I had a doctor who was an internist who I realized I had osteoporosis at age 22. So wow. weakening of the bones at age 22, that's really important for you guys to know. If you're out there and, and you're struggling with restrictive eating, which is what helped lead to my osteoporosis, you can actually develop osteoporosis in, as a teenager. The good news is that with recovery, that can actually reverse. I do not have osteoporosis today, but I did when I was 22. So part of my treatment team was a doctor who diagnosed that, but I also had a doctor that was a psychiatrist. I also had a therapist and a dietitian, and I went to support groups and therapy led groups. So there was a big team that I utilized to get better. And talking about the, the psychiatrist, now sometimes in order for me to do any of this stuff on this slide, like to face the food, to improve my body image, I actually needed medication. That's where my psychiatrist came on board. If it was left up to me alone, I don't think I ever would have been able to face the food, to eat, begin to learn how to eat in a balanced way. My brain chemistry was so messed up. Personally, I needed the help of a psychiatrist and medication to get better. I took all kinds of medication that's not actually normally used for eating disorders. And I'm not a doctor, so I don't tell specific medications, but I mentioned that because you know, psychiatry really is an art in many ways, and everybody can be very individualized on what medication helps them. And so just, me, so just a comment, if I could, for our uh, audience. So the psychiatrists are the experts with medications. Yes, yes. And it sounds like, so one of the key members of your recovery team was a psychiatrist who then said, well, looking at your uh you know lab tests and your symptoms and so on and let's try this medication and a good psychiatrist works with the individual and it sounds like for you uh that medication the medications were really key and uh, and played a really important role in your recovery yeah for me i mean and for both eating disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder and, and it's important to note i were i resisted at first i didn't want to take medication i told everybody i'm gonna do it on my own and i mentioned that because that hap i see that a lot and the truth is there there are there's medications out there that really do help so what i had to learn was why am i going to turn down a tool that's shown to help people and so again, yeah, you really need a psychiatrist though. And in terms of eating disorders, we do need a lot more research to find out, you know, what exact medications um, work when. There's one, FD, the FDA approved Prozac, Philoxetine, and Prozac's the brand name for, uh, it, it approved 
Prozac for bulimia nervosa years ago. And then recently, binge eating disorder, the FDA approved a medication for that. But in general, there's not a lot of like FDA approved medications for eating disorders. Psychiatrists really oftentimes go by their experience, you know, their clinical experience as well as the research. But so, yeah. Can I, can I just make a quick comment? Uh, in my experience and in talking with many of the psychiatrists that are part of ADAA, um, it can be very individual uh, okay. how people might respond to a particular medication. So having a good psychiatrist that's really willing to work with the individual can be really, really important. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because things that worked for my friends or that or that worked for a lot of people did not work for me. And I felt hopeless at first, but but we we found things that work. And we my psychiatrist was very smart and very creative and really listened, a good listener. So so yeah, but we're gonna talk about kind of these six topics, but a key to all of them is what's at the bottom. You know, we have to have hope. It's hope. We know research even shows hope is it's a necess it's necessary for people to recover across many illnesses, not just mental. But you have to have action too. Sitting around just hoping you'll get better and doing nothing about it doesn't actually work. Because I tried it for a long time and that doesn't work. And then you have to have persistence. Never give up. An eating disorder, it recovery is often a matter of years. We're not talking months or weeks. It's it's a long process. What we do know, research shows that the earlier you get help, the sooner you get better. So if you have a teenager with an eating disorder and you you caught it early, which you did if they're a teenager with an eating disorder, they often bounce back faster than maybe someone who diagnosed got a diagnosis when they were 60 and had their eating disorder for 40 years. But even still, I see those people fully recover too. So you know, anybody can get better if we put the work in and we get the right help. But real quick on this, you know, we just have to have hope that we really can get better. We can fully recover. And if you want to look up that study, I encourage you guys to Google it. Dr. Cameron Eddy out of Harvard, and she works with my colleague, Dr. Jennifer Thomas, they found out that in a 22-year follow-up study, most people got better, fully recovered from eating disorders. And what was key about this study was that they followed people for 22 years. Earlier studies hadn't followed people for quite that long. So in some studies we would think, well, wow, not as many people got better as we thought. But what we learned in this key study that just came out last year is that sometimes we weren't following people long enough. People did get better. And you might think, well, 22 years, that's a long time. It does not take everyone 22 years to get better. But there were some outliers in the study that it did take that long. But what is fully recovered? You know, when you first get into recovery, I, I used to say I'm in recovery. What What's in recovery versus recovered? Well, for me, when I was in recovery, I was going to doctors and therapists and I was starting to change my eating disorder behaviors, but I still had the eating disorder mindset, almost 100%. So some I was finally eventually able to do what my treatment team wanted me to do around food, but I still had Ed yelling in my head 24 hours a day and it was miserable. I, I want to tell you guys that is not fully recovered. That's a part of the process. That's being in recovery and still working hard. Don't stop there. I see a lot of people stop at in recovery. They get to kind of this mediocre recovery, which is much better than being sick with an eating disorder, but we don't want to settle for mediocre. And what does that mean? Well, for me, for so long, I struggled with restricting just a little, you know, I'm, well, I'm, I don't have anorexia anymore. I'm just restricting a little. Well, restricting a little hurts a lot. We cannot hold on to any eating disorder behaviors. That's how we I get, get what, what I'm hearing you say, Jenny, and I'm really loving what you're saying is that don't be satisfied with just a partial recovery because you yes. really can overcome the, these conditions. Yeah, totally. Don't don't settle for mediocre. You know, we in our book, Almost Anorexic, we say don't settle for almost recovered when fully recovered is possible. And a metaphor I love is my dietitian Reba Sloan used to use this, but she, and she says, you know, if you had a raging forest fire, say that's the eating disorder, and you put the forest fire out, would you leave like one tiny ember burning? Absolutely not, because what's going to happen? It's going to rage again. Yeah, so great, 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 great out, metaphor. I like that. You really need to put it all out. But so hope is just really important. And and I encourage. This is an exercise from my first book, Life Without Ed. But just 
it's helpful, I think, for people to take some time and think about what what is my vision of freedom from eating disorder? What is my vision? Because it's probably different from other people's vision. And and keep that vision posted on your refrigerator or as an, a note in your smartphone, you know, keep that vision around you because an eating disorder recovery, it can knock you down and you can feel really hopeless, but whatever you can do to maintain hope is, is so, so key. And family members, that's where we need you. Uh, my mom and dad were my hope holders. When I lost all hope, my family held it. And oftentimes loved ones, that's what we need you for. We need you to say, you can do it, because we often don't think we can. But as I mentioned earlier, I learned to kind of separate from my eating disorder and name it Ed, which can sound kind of crazy to people. And in many ways, this is cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a proven proven technique to help people with eating with certain eating disorders. But what, what, what happened was I went into therapy and in one of my first therapy sessions, my therapist pulled up an empty chair and he said, let's pretend like your eating disorder is sitting in this chair. And he said, let's name it, Ed. And then he said, let's talk to the chair. Jenny, talk to Ed. Well, I'll tell you what, I thought my therapist needed more therapy than me. <laughs> it sounded crazy, you know? I mean, I don't know if you had that experience in therapy, Neil, but like sometimes therapists say things that sound crazy. Yeah. <laughs> But, it but, actually, I, but I'm, picturing, I'm picturing that session. <clears throat> so what was it like having the, the dialogue with Ed? Well, I mean, great question, because at first there was no dialogue because Ed was the only one talking, you know? I mean, that's why we did it, like was to help me find a voice. That's what the metaphor, the why we do it. For me, it was really to learn I am, am separate from my eating disorder. I can find a voice. And in the beginning, I didn't have a voice separate, but my therapist helped me to say things. And eventually I started believing some of those things. And like they say in 12 step meetings, a lot of it was fake it till you make it. But eventually I learned to say, Ed, I will get rid of you. I don't know how, but I will, I'm gonna do it. And that felt really good to take a little bit of my power back. And as soon as I separated from Ed, all of a sudden the problem definition changed from, I used to think I am an eating disorder. Well, I am an eating disorder is a really hard problem to solve. But what if you change it to, I tend to agree with everything my eating disorder says. I'm in a relationship with Ed and I do everything he says to do. That's bad, but the good news is that that's a problem I can solve because I can start disagreeing with Ed and I can start disobeying Ed. And that's what the metaphor for me was real. What's what it was about. It helped my family a lot to see that Ed was not me. Ed hijacked my brain and I became moody and I yelled and I did horrible things sometimes. That was my eating disorder. It helped my family to see that's Ed, Jenny is over here. That, so that's a helpful technique for families. It also puts everyone on the same team. With me, it was everybody's on Jenny's team and we're all fighting against Ed. So that really helped, you know, does that make I, sense? I love, I love these bullet points you have on, on the slide where you get to the point where you had a divorce decree from Ed. I love oh that. yeah, yeah. And that then, was one of my tools. Was I just yeah. had to work in the beginning? It was just separating from Ed, and you can actually go to my website and download some of these. But these are just tools on how how to how to separate from Ed and and to and find the Declaration your own. of Independence. I love that one too. Yeah, that was a I, that was a fun one. I took that to my group therapy, and all the members of my group signed it for me, and I hung it on my wall for a long time. But um, real quick before we move on, one of the challenges of this technique is people tend to blame Ed. So what I mean is in the beginning of recovery, I'd, I'd go to therapy and, and I'd say, you know, I'm, I binge today and all these things happen. I'm not doing well. And I'd say, but it's not my fault. Ed made me do it. Well, that's not the point of separating from Ed is so we can blame Ed for everything. The point of the metaphor is absolutely the reverse. As soon as we separate from Ed, we can take accountability. It doesn't matter what Ed says, what matters is how I respond to Ed. So again, that was key for me, but it was scary. I mean, this slide, I get this question all the time. That's why it's on this PowerPoint. People email me. This is the most common question I get is, who am I without Ed, Jenny? If I give up Ed, and this is an example from our book, and this person named Dante, but look at that. Ed took up most of his life, all of his life, you know, or most of it. You know, Joanna was his wife and work, have a little, small slices of the pie, but what happens when all of a sudden you give up the weightlifting and the muscularity? That is a big 
empty space. And that is scary for people. If I give up my eating disorder, what's going to take that place? What if it's not good? What if it's worse than my eating disorder? And these are risks that we're taking in recovery. So, so his uh, behaviors that related to his eating disorder were the weightlifting and the muscularity. Right. Um, sure. I see. This is a case study in our book. And I so see. if you look at like his, the amount of his self-worth, his self-evaluation that was based on eating disordered thoughts, that's a lot. It's more than 75%, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, that's a lot. And so in recovery, we're changing that. And, and like I said, if you imagine taking out the weightlifting and the muscularity, that leaves a, a big empty white space, right? And that feels scary for people. But it's also exciting. I compare it to like being in an empty or being in a room. So like right now I'm in my office, I have some plants and like these cool curtains I hung, my mom helped me make and like, it's this, you know, it's my comfy office. Well, what happened if all of a sudden people, someone came and stripped everything out of this office? It'd be like an empty room. And that's how it feels like in recovery. You're used to your office the way it is. Of course, an eating disorder office is very dysfunctional, but you're used to that. And, but then in recovery, you give up all the behaviors. And it's like you're sitting in this empty room with no furniture, and that's really uncomfortable. Well, to get better, we have to get uncomfortable. The exciting part is, how are we going to fill our empty room? You know, what's my new office going to look like? What's my, what do I want? Do I want a pink couch? That's my favorite color. You know, what do I want? That's the exciting part of recovery is we get to design our lives. Our eating disorder takes up so much of our life. When we get rid of that, wow, we can fill it up with life. That's, that's an amazing a gift of recovery. But how do you find help? I mean, and so to get better, I had to increase my structure and support. I could not get better on my own. And trust me, I tried. I write self-help books and I will tell you, my books will not cure you. I promise, don't try it. Because I tried. I went and bought books on eating disorders from the bookstore back when there actually were a lot of bookstores. And I thought that if I read these books, they will save my life. And, and I was wrong. Those books gave me hope and inspiration, but went to get better, I needed help. And so your books, your books, Jenny, can be part of the recovery picture, a really important part. And, and the point I'm hearing you make is to really have a good recovery. It's really important to have a treatment team. And uh, maybe uh, for our viewers, you might want to uh, pause the, uh, the the webinar to make some notes from uh, of the resources that are on this page. How do I find uh, a certified eating disorder specialist, a dietitian? Um, checking out the uh, NIDA website. These are great resources. Yeah, and that's those those credentials, the CEDS that's underlined and CEDRD, those are relatively new and they're very important. So to get better from an eating disorder, we really need specialists. And so look for those, ask people, interview your therapist who you might see and find out, you know, how much do they know about eating disorders? It's so, so key. And sometimes people live in an area where they can't find like a doctor who specializes in eating disorders. And that's actually why I put that little purple book on the screen. That's actually a brochure made by the Academy for Eating Disorders. They actually made that to train physicians. So I know a lot of parents and people with eating disorders who've taken that little book and you can download it from the Academy for Eating Disorders website. They take that little book to therapy, to um, physician sessions or even therapy sessions, but specifically give it to their doctors and say, this is a guide to medical care. I need you to read this if they're not an expert. And, and it's really helpful. That's why AED it made it. Cause unfortunately primary care docs who don't know eating disorders, they can do a lot of harm. Like I've had I, countless people I know had their primary care doctor told them, congratulations, you lost weight. Well, it was an eating disorder. You know, it didn't deserve congratulations. They actually needed help. So the organization is the Academy? For eating disorders. That's how to find the okay. little purple book. Okay, great. Um, and it's aedweb.org. But, and then key beyond the professional help, which is key, is support can be very helpful from people in recovery. So. National Eating Disorders Association has forums and different links to lead you to support groups in your area. Eating Disorders Anonymous is helpful. You can go to meetings online, over the phone. Recovery Records actually a research-based smartphone app that 
can help connect you with other people struggling. It can also connect you to your dietitian. It's really cool. People can eat their lunch and like take a picture of their plate before and after and send it to their therapist, their treatment team. So technology can do a lot these days to actually connect us with other people, which for me was was a key, was key staying connected to my treatment team, my family and my friends. But so this is just an exercise you can download too. It's from our book Almost Anorexic, but I'd encourage you, it looks like this, and what you do is you write your you write initials of the people, or the names if you write really small, but you can just put initials of people who would fit into different those different concentric circles or the different categories of friends or treatment team. What I noticed in my life, if I would have done this exercise when I was really struggling, is I would have seen that I had a lot of treatment relationships, but I didn't have a lot in the other. I was living in Nashville, Tennessee. My whole family was in Texas, so I didn't see them on a daily basis, and I was very isolated. So this exercise can really help people see how isolated am I, and where, where do I have support, where do I need support? So we cannot get better in a vacuum. We have to have people around us. We have to have people around us and we have to face the food. This is the hard part. I, I'll tell you what, Neil, I was going to be the one person who was going to recover from my eating disorder without facing the food. <laughs> I was actually, I thought if I just read books or journaled or went to therapy, I'd get better. Well, the truth is I had to face the food and facing the food only gets easy by doing it. Eating becomes easy by eating, not by thinking about it or journaling about it, but by doing it. And Food is the best medicine for an eating disorder. So key is that people can be now malnourished at any size. Your brain can be malnourished no matter what size you are. Eating disorders are serious. All eating disorders are serious. All eating disorders need to find a balanced relationship with food. The Dr. Ansel Keys did a cool study that kind of speaks to what we were talking about earlier in terms of feast and famine, but it was a study he did to help figure out how to refeed war victims from World War II. So before, toward the end of the war, Dr. Ansel Keys got some male uh, conscientious, consci conscientious objectors to the war, healthy, strong men to participate, to be starved, event, essentially. These men volunteered to be starved. They wanted to help help some way in the war effort. And what Dr. Ansel Keys found is that the mere act of starving perfectly healthy, normal men actually created eating disorder behaviors in these men. Many of these men started binging. So again, the restricting leading to the binging. Many of these men started collecting recipes, which is often seen with like anorexia nervosa. Men started thinking about food all of the time, dreaming about it. So Essentially, you had healthy men without eating disorders. You restrict, you restrict them, and all of a sudden, you're getting eating disorder behaviors. That shows you just the biological response to dieting for some people, right? So again, to get better, we have to face the food. We have so to facing actually, the food is the opposite of the restricting. Yeah, it's the it's the opposite of the binging and the purging. It's finding the middle ground. It's it's what I learned intuitive eating, which you see there. It's not focusing on dieting. It's I, I learned that, you know, there's no good or bad foods. We're taught that broccoli is good and chocolate cake is bad. Well, you know what? Like food doesn't have a moral value. Food is just food. And if I do intuitive eating, if I eat when I'm hungry, stop when I'm full, if I eat what I'm truly craving, my body is going to eat an appropriate amount of broccoli versus chocolate cake, right? If I really eat intuitively, my body is going to know what it wants to eat. And intuitive eating, it honors our emotions without using food. So intuitive eating means we try to experience our emotions without, you know, using food, either restricting or binging to cope with that. Intuitive eating is also flexible. Sometimes we eat when we're not hungry just because we're at a party. Or like yesterday, I had a surprise delivery to my door of chocolate chip cookies. It was so amazing. They were still warm. I was not hungry and I ate them because they were warm and they came to my door and it was so cool. <laughs> so that's intuitive eating. Intuitive eating is flexible. And that's something that takes a long time to get to. I can't emphasize people need dietitians to do this work. They need therapists. They need doctors. It can't do so this on Just to pause before you go on just for a moment, and I'm looking at your bullet points, and what I'm seeing is that every one of these suggested uh, approaches is different from eating disorder. 
Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's opposite, which is why sometimes recovery feels so uncomfortable. For me, recovery felt like I was becoming left-handed and I'm right-handed. It was as if my treatment team tied my right hand behind my back and made me do everything with my left hand. Well, that would feel really weird, but that's how recovery feels in the beginning. But if we keep doing it, it actually becomes normal. It actually starts feeling right. So that's the hope I want to encourage you guys. It's really hard in the beginning, but now intuitive eating just comes naturally to me. I don't think about it. It's just part of who I am. It's easy. It's just, it's just my life. It's like a training wheels on a bicycle. I had the training wheels and now they're off. But come so exercise too. That's something sometimes people with eating disorders struggle with compulsive exercise. Not everyone, but what we know, and you'll notice I said compulsive exercise and not over exercise. We used to think it was people who over exercise were maybe the ones who struggled. And that can be a part of dangerous exercise behavior. But what we found in research was exercise really becomes dangerous when it's like compulsive. So it's compulsive, not necessarily over exercise, although you can have, you know, exercising too much can be compulsive too. But what are the signs of exercise problems? Well, it's those five signs you see listed there. So some examples like rule driven behavior, you know, I have to take the exercise class every single Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, you know, eight o'clock AM. I can never miss one ever. It's raining, I'm sick, it's freezing out, no one's on the road driving, but I'm still gonna go. You know, being really driven compulsively to take that class, even though all signs point to maybe you shouldn't take that class today, that can be a sign of compulsive exercise. When we exercise only to control our weight, that's the only reason we exercise, that can be a problem. When we exercise, when we use exercise as a way to improve our mood, and that's our only way to improve our mood, then exercise is a problem. Yes, exercise can improve mood. Tons of research shows that. But we can't have exercise as the only way to improve our mood. We have to have other ways. And sometimes, I mean, have you noticed, like people can be so rigid with exercise that they do something they don't even enjoy. Like I see people, I used to belong to a gym and I would see people running on the treadmill and they, their face was just like in pain and misery. I'm like, why are you doing that? There's no enjoyment in that for, for that person. So think about it. Do you do exercise that you hate and you make yourself do it every day to control your weight and you're rigid about it? Well, that could be a problem. And this, there's actually, a, I, I put a research-based compulsive exercise test on my site and you guys can take it um, and it'll give you some results. Again, this cannot diagnose you, but you could take the test and kind of bring the results to a professional you're working with and maybe start working on compulsive exercise. I had to actually, I developed compulsive exercise in the middle of my eating disorder recovery. So when once I started eating again in a more balanced way, I, my dietitian told me I could start exercising. And so I did, but unfortunately for me, you know, that obsessive compulsive trait that I had kicked in and I became for the first time in my life compulsive with exercise. And I had to look at it and eventually move toward intuitive exercise. And so that's like intuitive eating, what we just talked about. It's flexible, A, you know, and it's really driven by how we feel. What do I feel like I want to do? That's a picture of me in Alaska ice climbing. Oh, wow. That's okay. what I wanted to do that day. <laughs> that's intuitive exercise. Um, I did not go to a treadmill in Anchorage, Alaska because there's a big block of ice I could climb, you know, that's intuitive. And so you guys can read these things on your own, but like intuitive eating exercise, a key is that you do the exercise because you want to, it's not because you have to. And we have to remember exercise can be stuff that we're already doing in our life. Like yesterday I spent a long time cleaning my house, walking room to room, putting things where they belong. and that was like a lot of walking in my house. It was house cleaning. House cleaning is a lifestyle activity that sometimes is exercise. And we have to take that into account. When I used to wait tables, I was on my feet for six hours a night. That is exercise. So we, this is so important because sometimes there'll be people who maybe they're on their feet all day as a nurse or something like that. And then they come home and they feel like they have to go to the gym and run three miles. Well, well, no, you've been exercising all day. So again, intuitive exercise, it's not what people think of exercise. It doesn't mean you have to go to a gym. In fact, you don't, no gym has to be involved. You don't even need a gym to do it. 
I mean, and eventually I was able to find intuitive exercise. And a key piece is intuitive exercise means sometimes you just lay on your couch and do nothing. Sometimes that's what my body is craving. It's tired. And I just lay down and, you know, watch Netflix. And that's intuitive sometimes. So again, you're seeing the flexibility piece. Flexibility and overall a lot more enjoyment. Yes, fun. I mean, now I don't even belong to a gym right now. I have, you know, two bicycles inside my house and two bicycles in my garage. <laughs> I like bicycles, you know. I, I like walking. I live in Austin, Texas. There's beautiful hikes by the river. That's what I like to do. But you guys remember that picture at the very beginning of me in the tutu. Negative body image was the first part of my eating disorder to come along. And what was really hard was that it was the last part of my eating disorder to leave. And this is true for a lot of us. And to improve my body image, I had to really start shifting my perspective from what my body looks like to what it does. My body is a vehicle for life. It's like a car, it's how I get around. Many of us in America treat our cars better than we treat our bodies. And think about it, we have one body. My friend Carolyn Costin talks about our body as being our earth suit. It's our, it's our earth suit. It's our way to get around. It's meant to be a vehicle, it's something we can appreciate. When I was climbing up that waterfall in Alaska, I was not thinking about the size of my hips. I was thinking about how strong my body was so that I didn't fall to the rocks below. That's an important shift and it takes a while. But for and time, body image takes time and patience. What we often see is that this lingering negative body image can hang around for, for years for some people. And often during that time, Ed will come back in, the eating disorder, and say, hey, okay, you still hate your body. Well, guess what? I can help you. And then people end up going back to the eating disorder. So time and patience sit in that discomfort through the negative body image until it gets better. Because if you don't sit with it, and if you go back to Ed, you're just gonna have to do it all over again. I know from experience, time and patience is key. And I began using curiosity as a big tool. So if I look in the mirror and all of a sudden, I think I, I used to think like, I'd look in the mirror and think, oh, I look fat right now. But the night before I didn't look fat, well, the truth is I could not gain weight overnight. So I began looking in the mirror with curiosity rather than fear, like, huh, how did that happen? How do my eyes see something different today? And eye tracking studies and eating disorders actually show people with eating disorders, when they look in the mirror, they tend to focus on the negative, where other people tend to look at the positive, like, oh, you have cool hair, then the normal person with, and I use normal lightly, but the person without an eating disorder, like they're gonna look in the mirror and go, oh, I have great hair. The person with the eating disorder ignores their great hair and looks at the pimple on their nose. You know, so we have to realize eye tracking and studies. There's the perfectionism again popping yeah, up. Yeah, there's perfectionism. You know, and also there's so many visual tricks. Our eyes really do play tricks on us. We see things differently. We don't sometimes see reality. We don't even know what reality is. I mean, that's that's the picture. Do you remember that dress? The the dress. It was either black and blue. Some people saw it as black and blue. Some people saw it as white and gold. Do you remember that, Neil? Yeah. yeah. All of, which, what do you, how yeah. do you see it? I, I, saw, I see it as the gold. Yeah, that's how I see it right now. But yeah. so people see it differently and that's just curious, you know? That's how our eyes can really play tricks on us. It's like ambiguous figures. We created this one here on the right for our book. And that figure can be looked at as a thin woman who's you know, stand, looking straight and that's a feather cap on, or it can be looked at as a larger woman who's turned to the side. And that's just to show how our eyes can can be swapped to look at the same thing in very different ways. So start using curiosity. And one thing we know with research, if you want to improve your body image, stop body checking. Number one thing, don't do it. What does that mean? Get rid of the scale. <laughs> Many people with eating disorders, we get rid of the scale. We get rid of tape measures. We get rid of our skinny jeans that we know how they fit us and we use them to body check ourselves. We get rid of the mirror if we have to for a while, if we use the mirror as a way to check our body, to pinch fat. Now, that doesn't mean for the rest of your life you have to get rid of all of these things. But in fact, in the in the end, like it actually helped me to bring the scale back for a bit just to just to show that I could look at the scale and step on it and not freak out about it but that wasn't until much later in recovery in the beginning though therapists would tell you you really need to get rid of anything you use to check your body 
whatever it is, get rid of it, give it to a friend. Something we did in group was we'd give it to each other and you know, my friend would, Marissa would keep my skinny jeans in her closet for as long as I wanted her to. And if I ever wanted them back, she would give them the back, but I never asked them back. It happens a lot. So this again, this is body checking. This is just a tool, another exercise you guys can download. Um, my Dr. Thomas made this up. It's obstruct, limit, and delay and distract. These are ways to kind of stop yourselves from body checking. So obstruct, we talked about that. Get rid of everything. Limit, you know, mirror. Limit the mirror to only when you're brushing your teeth at night or in the morning, right? Don't go into the mirror every day to check to see if the pimple on your nose is getting any bigger. <laughs> I used to do that. It doesn't help. And if you can, just delay and distract. If you have a big trigger to go step on the scale and you still have a scale, set your timer for 20 minutes and see if you maybe don't need to do it after 20 minutes. Maybe you still do. Maybe you don't. But that's just a way to start practicing really limiting body checking because we know body checking keeps us stuck in eating disordered behaviors. So we need to get rid of it to get out of our eating disorder. And, you know, back to the beginning, hope, you know, we got to keep hope. I was, t I talked about in the beginning, we need hope plus action plus persistence. And I love, I learned in recovery, hope means hold on pain ends. And I love that. I, I think inspirational quotes can be super helpful for people. You know, go online, pick your favorite quotes and paste them all over your house. I used to call that post-it note therapy and it was helpful to me. Sometimes I don't know what my landlord thought at the time. I <laughs> covered in like paper. Um, but this is the action part. This is actually me jumping out of an airplane. Oh, wow. Love it. In New Zealand. But I will tell you guys, I did not want to jump out of the plane um, when I first tried. So five days before this picture, I got in a similar airplane and I went up with the pilot and they said, okay, Jenny, it's your turn to jump. And I freaked out, had a panic attack, the first one in my life, and went down in the plane with the pilot and did not jump. And I realized, wow, this is a big metaphor for recovery. Because how many times did I go up in the recovery airplane and I had all these tools, I had a dietitian, doctors, medication, I had all these things on board, and my treatment team would say, Jenny, okay, face the food, you know, follow your food plan. And I, I wouldn't do it. I was scared to take that leap of faith because what if I jump and the parachute doesn't open? So I'll just stay in the plane for a while because, you know, it's a lot safer. So I'd encourage you guys to think about where in your recovery have you not jumped yet? Maybe you're not in recovery yet. Maybe you need to just get on the recovery airplane. That's the first step. But eventually we have to trust that our parachute will open, that if we follow the advice of our treatment team, we will get better. And I, apl I actually applied recovery principles to skydiving, Neil, and that's how I jumped out of that plane. <laughs> huh, I love it. And um, it was funny because I paid extra, you know, to get pictures taken. And they said, the picture guy said that I was the only person in that, see that big smile on my face? Uh -huh. He said, I'm the only person he's caught with a smile. Normally people are freaked out. It's because I was so <laughs> happy. I was facing my fear. I still have anxiety. I was so anxious, you guys. But I jumped and did it anyway. And the parachute did open. So that was, that was really, really a happy moment. <laughs> but, um, you know, Persistence, that was the last thing. We have to have hope, action, and persistence. Never quit. Remember all those traits we had on that slide? Perfectionism, obsessive compulsiveness, the ability to delay gratification was one. Well, those are all traits that I now use for good. You're looking at a picture of all the rejection letters for my first book, Life Without Ed. <laughs> and there's oh, I love them. that. I couldn't fit them all in the picture. I got rejected so many times for that book. People were like, who's Ed? They thought that was crazy. Well, why did I keep sending letters? It's pretty clear no one wants that book. Well, I kept sending letters because of perfectionism. It makes me motivated and driven. Obsessive compulsiveness makes me conscientious. The ability to lay gratification, I don't use it with food anymore so I can diet better. I use it to deal with all the rejection and how long it took to get a book deal. <laughs> so that's just a hopeful message again. You're not born with an eating disorder. You're born with traits, traits that are actually beautiful and good and we can use them for life. And never, never give up, you guys. You know, full, full recovery really is 100% possible. That's actually what my second book, Goodbye Ed, Hello Me, is all about. Um, when I wrote my first book, the one you just saw, I actually didn't know you could fully recover. I thought like you could get to that in recovery place, which was pretty great compared to having an eating disorder. But five years later, after that book was published, I realized, wow, it gets even better than this. 
like much better. So again, you know, don't settle for mediocre, go all the way because you really can get better. And but we need help and we need professionals and we need our families. If you are a family member, remember, you guys hold the hope. We need that. Um, and we can get better. But thank you so much, Neil. Well, like, thank you, Jenny, so much for your presentation. Uh, and for our viewers, I really want to encourage you uh, explore Jenny's website, explore her books, um, share this webinar with uh, friends and family members that you think it might be helpful for. Uh, maybe come back to the webinar in a little while and view it again to really take advantage of the wonderful resources that are here. So uh, thanks everybody for watching and uh, we'll say goodbye for now. Thanks again, Jenny, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, you guys. And I would love to um, stay connected. So please do reach out to me on social media or that website, meadowsranch.com. That's the treatments that I work with, Meadows Ranch. And I do write a lot of blogs for them. So if you're interested in learning more about eating disorders, you can check that out for some latest and greatest information. But thank you, Neil. And I have to thank ADAA. ADAA helped save my life, like I said, with PTSD. And you guys are doing such, such great work with, with so many mental illnesses. So thanks, Neil, for what you do. It makes a huge difference. I just wish you would have been around in 1998 when I needed you in college. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I needed great. a webinar then. <laughs> well, thanks again, Jenny. Bye-bye. Bye now.